let's talk about design of gravity wells. So when we do the design, we have to think about the different failure mechanisms that might happen. And there are five of them that we'll be concerned about here. So uh, the first possible failure mode is um, overturning about the toe, which is shown right there. So if you imagine that there's the toe of the wall right there and there's a force acting on it, it's quite possible that it might just topple over and end up on its side. Uh, in order to do that, it would need to pivot about that, that point of the toe and uplift over the rest of it. As we'll see, it's, as long as we design the wall for an adequate factor of safety against bearing failure, this um, overturning mode is not really going to be an issue because the bearing pressure is infinite right there. This is really only going to happen if a wall is founded on something very uh, stiff and strong. Okay, the second mode is sliding. That's where the base capacity of the wall is just not as high as the, um, as the horizontal force imposed by the soil. And instead of toppling over, it just slides horizontally on a weak layer underneath. Third one is bearing failure. So this one looks a little like the toppling failure or the overturning failure. It would settle and probably rotate too because as we'll see, it's an eccentric inclined load acting on the bottom of this wall, which is basically like the footing, right? So because of the overturning moment this way, it's gonna to tend to rotate during bearing capacity failure instead of just punching straight down. Uh, the fourth one is settlement, excessive settlement or excessive deflection. Um, okay, so settlement is pretty obvious if the, if the footing settles too much, if it's on a soft compressible material that's going to consolidate or something like that. And we have a concrete wall that's maybe somewhat fragile or prone to damage, then that excessive settlement can be a problem. Excessive deflection can also be a problem if the stem is designed to be too flexible and you build it vertically, it might tip a little bit. And if people are walking underneath here, it, it gives the, you know, like this feeling that the wall's coming over on them. So usually we'll design walls, not vertical to have a little bit of a batter and make them stiff enough that they don't deform too much. And then of course there's global failure. This would be basically like a slope stability failure underneath the wall. And we always have to do the global stability check to make sure that we're not going to get that kind of failure because even if we have a perfectly well-functioning wall here with respect to earth pressure, uh, if it fails because of this global stability, it may be a problem. And notice that the presence of the wall actually might make the global stability problem worse because we've excavated away some soil here that was providing a restoring moment and we've put it here maybe to increase the driving moment in this particular case. All right, so let's look at detail in detail at some of these calculations. Some of them depend somewhat on the configuration. So I'll focus primarily on the fundamentals here and it, they can be adapted to other scenarios or different wall configurations. So for the overturning check, we have the weight of the wall. We have the active force resultant here acting at an angle delta. And then we do have a resisting force on the bottom but the problem is that if, if we're dealing with overturning about the toe, there's only one point that's in contact with the soil at that overturning moment, and that is the toe. So the resisting force has to act through the toe. And so uh, really, we, if we're doing some of moments about this point, we don't even consider the resisting force. We have a resisting moment that's from the weight and maybe the vertical component of the um, active force resultant active earth pressure resultant, and then we have an overturning moment that's caused by the horizontal component of the um, earth pressure resultant. So here we have the um, overturning moment in this case is going to be the horizontal component, PA times cosine of delta times H1, where H1 is the height of that resultant force. Generally, we assume that that acts at one third of the height of the wall. So H1 would be H over three, where H is the full height of wall that's in contact with soil back there. Okay, then the resisting moment would be the weight times B over two because the footing width is B. And again, this is a rectangular wall, so the geometry is very easy. Then we would also have a vertical component of the active force resultant on the back, and that's PA times sine delta times uh, B. Right, B is the moment arm for that one. So we end up with a factor safety equation against overturning that's right here. And that has to generally be greater than or equal to two. 
and if it's not greater than or equal to 2, you would need to increase the width of the wall, right? Make B a little bit bigger. Okay, a common dimension would be that B is about 0.7 times the height, something like that. Kind of a rough, crude estimate, but that's a good starting point to do your calculations to ensure this overturning um, factor of safety is okay. Uh, okay, now a few notes. First, passive resistance at the toe is usually neglected. Okay, typically a wall is embedded a little bit on the downhill side. And so there is some passive force that would be mobilized and in this case would pose a slight resisting moment um, to the wall that would benefit us. And it would also impose loading that would help us against sliding too. The reason we ignore it is that we don't want our wall to be dependent on soil when that soil might be excavated away at some point or erosion might take it away or something like that. So we usually just ignore it for conservatism. The second note is for oddly shaped walls, you may have to create a table like the one shown here that has uh, different shapes for this particular concrete cantilever wall. I have, I've divided it into five different shapes. They're all triangles or rectangles. And um, you can compute the area of each shape and then its weight by multiplying by the appropriate unit weight. And then you can compute a force, a moment arm, and then you can sum up the resisting moments there. The driving moment, again, is just going to be caused by the active force resultant. So that's pretty easy. You don't need to um, divide that up into different shapes. Let's look now to sliding instability. So this is where there's some, some weight. We have the active force resultant. Then on the bottom, we have a resisting force that's normal to the wall base and then a shear force that's transverse to the direction of the wall base. And so here we would have um, R is equal to W plus PA sine delta, just by equilibrium. And then we can compute the normal stress acting on the bottom, R over B, right? And then we would have the shear force, T is equal to PA times cosine of delta, PA cos delta is the only other horizontal force here. And then we would have the shear strength divided by this equation right here, where we have uh, CA, which is the adhesion along the interface between the bottom of the wall and the soil, plus this normal stress, um, general, usually an effective stress, but it, you know, it could be a total stress also, times the tangent of delta sub B, where delta B is the interface friction angle between the bottom of the wall and the soil. Delta B might be different than the delta that acts between the vertical part of the wall and the soil. Sometimes the vertical part of the wall might be smoother. Uh, it's also generally a mobilized friction that we're using, like two-thirds of the friction angle or something like that, whereas the capacity on the bottom is usually higher than two-thirds of feet, as we'll see. Okay, and then here's the shear stress, T over B, and here's the factor of safety against sliding. It's the shear strength divided by the equilibrium shear stress. And I've written it all out here in terms of these components for this particular wall. For a different wall, you might have different components here. And usually we uh, will make sure that that factor of safety is greater than or equal to 1.5. And if it's not, we may need to uh, do something like make the base wider, um, add a shear key. So a shear key would be the base of the wall would look like, like this. You know, here's the wall and the base. You could come in and add a little bit of uh, an excavation and a chunk of concrete in there. So there's a shear key and that adds a lot of capacity because now that shear key has to fail in passive mode, um, the soil that's underneath it. So that's uh, another mitigation strategy. Here we go. For uh, the um, friction constant that you can use, the CA and the delta, there was this study by Padiandi back in 1964 where he looked at the interface friction angle between different types of soil and different types of, of structural materials. So, you know, here you've got, uh, for example, sandy material, um, dry and saturated and dense ver versus different structural uh, materials. So here's concrete on the bottom, which is the most common one for retaining walls. Um, there's also wood and steel and so forth, and you can come and get these parameters. So the F phi is basically a delta. Um, oh, F phi is equal to delta over phi, right? It's defined up here where delta is the interface friction angle. And then F C is C 
alpha C A over C, where C would be the cohesion or undering strength of the material. And notice these are all pretty high, especially for concrete, right? We're dealing with 0.76 all the way up to 0.98, right? 0.98 for dry sand against rough ground. And rough ground is usually what we have when we cast uh, footing directly on um, the, the ground, right? We don't, we don't polish the bottom of the excavation before casting the concrete. It's just roughly placed. And so you're going to get a pretty high interface friction angle most of the time. And you can see in, the, in this one row, all of these numbers are pretty big, right? With the exception maybe for the FC value for clay, and that may be caused by some disturbance and so forth that you get when you make the excavation. So anyway, this table is very useful for assigning those capacities. Third one, instability due to bearing. So we've got, this is a concrete cantilever wall right here where we have the weight of the wall stem and the weight of some soil behind the wall. And then here's the resultant force. Um, usually for bearing capacity, we'll ignore the weight of the footing because we assume that the weight of the concrete that replaces the soil uh, doesn't introduce any real new bearing pressure, right? Concrete and soil have close to the same unit weights. So um, oftentimes we'll just ignore that weight. You could always include it. If you do include it, you should also subtract out the weight of the soil that it's replaced to get the net bearing pressure that's acting on the bottom. So the way we do this is to take this wall system and treat it as a spread footing with respect to the, the base of the wall in a manner that preserves all of the forces acting on it. So here's a diagram showing what I mean. We've got just the typical strip footing here. Everything that I'm doing is going to assume a strip footing because generally walls are pretty long in the out of plane dimension compared to their height. Um, and what we end up with is a vertical load, right? The vertical load would come from these weights. And then we have a horizontal load. That's the horizontal component of PA. And there's a moment because that horizontal load acts at some height above the bottom of the footing. So we have an eccentric load because there's a moment. We have an inclined load because of this horizontal force. So we need to do some corrections to the bearing capacity calculations to account for this eccentric inclined loaded footing. The first one that I'll show pertains to the moment when we have an eccentric loading with an axial load in a moment. The way we generally handle this is to recognize that this is a force couple. A force in a moment can also be represented as a force acting at some eccentric distance away from the center line. So we move that vertical force over by a distance E, the eccentricity, which is equal to the moment divided by the vertical force. And then um, we assume that that column load now, which captures the moment, is centered on a footing with an equivalent width equal to B prime, and B prime is B minus 2E, right? So this little distance from between the center line and the center of the column is E. This little distance right there is B over 2 minus E, and therefore uh, this full distance here is B minus 2E. And so we just use this B prime in our bearing calculations. And as long as it can accommodate that uh, load over the reduced footing width, then we don't have to worry about the eccentric load. Uh, notice that in order for a footing to tip over, B minus 2E would have to become zero. That's where you would get this rotation of the footing. So as long as you design a footing to satisfy bearing capacity, it's not going to tip, right? We still do the overturning check, but that's just never going to be a thing unless you really do found the, the wall like on something very strong. And then I'll go through this quickly. Bearing capacity is not really the uh, focus of this class, but here's the equation, right, for the ultimate bearing capacity. And then we have these bearing factors and we have the inclination factors, um, depth factors. So this is for load inclination, depth, um, base inclination, and ground inclination. And here I've written out the equations for these bearing factors. You can find them in any kind of foundation engineering textbook. Uh, these ones are for a smooth footing. And notice that you have a cotangent phi here. So if phi is zero, you just have to separately know that these are the bearing factors. NC is two plus pi or 5.14. NQ is one and N gamma is zero. Then we have depth factors. Um, these are the ones from Vesich, and I won't go through them, but you can quickly input these and get the, um, the depth factors for the, how deeply embedded your footing is. Notice that we measure depth on this side, 
right? We don't measure it over here because the footing is not going to fail that direction. It's going to fail the other way. And then there's uh, load inclination factors, base inclination factors from Brink Hansen and ground inclination factors as well. Okay, and then there's settlement and deflection. So sometimes concrete cantilever walls have to be pile supported. That's where we put the piles on stiff soil so that they don't settle too much if there's soft compressible soil underneath the wall and that way we can protect the wall stem and not have too much settlement and things like that. Um, and then I mentioned before we want to make sure that the stem doesn't deform too much also and so that has to be designed by a structural engineer. And then there's also global failure and we've done this already in this class, right? That was um, doing slope stability modeling. So you always have to do that global check just to make sure you're not gonna have a slope stability failure. And that's it.